photons, the quantum of the electromagnetic field. Now, why are we so interested in the electromagnetic spectrum? Well, light is visible light is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, right? It's a part we think of as being very important because we can see it, but there are all kinds of light ranging across a vast array of wavelengths. And these are associated with, we'll find out, a vast array of photon energies. Why are we interested in this broad range of, of light and electromagnetic radiation? Because spectroscopy, the interaction of light with matter, is the primary means that we use to probe bonding structure and dynamics. Light and electromagnetic radiation are associated with photons, so we have to ask ourselves, what are photons? And there's a long-standing debate about whether photons are waves or particles. So let's look at classical electromagnetic waves. We've got an oscillating electric field. It oscillates in a plane here. And perpendicular to that, you have an oscillating magnetic field. Waves also have a well-defined wavelength, lambda. That's the distance between two maxima. Or if we sat here in one place and counted the number of maxima that went by, that would be the frequency. They also have a characteristic frequency. The plane of polarization, that's the plane in which that electric field is operating, is oscillating. Now, we can represent waves using sines and cosines. Let's pick a cosine wave here, and then we could represent how the electric field and magnetic field are oscillating in space and time. We could do that either in terms of the wavelength and frequency, or we could introduce the angular frequency and the wave vector and get this little more compact notation with some electric field uh, amplitude out here. Alternatively, we can express waves as complex exponential functions, right? A cosine can be represented as an e to the ix plus an e to the minus ix term, all right? So we could, and that i, remember the i is the square root of minus 1. That represents an imaginary number, right? So if we have a complex number, we have a real part and an imaginary part. So we could equivalently, equivalently express our oscillating electric field as this exponential function, either with this exp notation or Euler's number e raised to a power. Importantly, right, there's a real part that represents the physical wave, and the imaginary part contains a phase. And if we're going to compare two waves, this relative phase difference between them is important. If we're going to try to look at the intensity of a wave, we have to take the square of it, the absolute square. And if we're using complex numbers like this notation here, then to get the absolute square, we have to take the complex conjugate times the function. The complex conjugate, that's where we take each value of i and we switch that to minus i, or each value of minus i, we turn that to i. We do that for every one of those values in the complex conjugate, and then we do the multiplication. Now, waves with well-defined phases are subject to interference phenomena once we combine them, right? So if we have waves that are in phase, in phase means that their maxima line up with each other, their minima line up with each other, and so when we combine them, we get constructive interference. The maxima will be even higher, and the minima will be even lower. If they're out of phase, and here we've got, in both cases here, we've got waves with the same wavelength, right? But now they're out of phase. That means the minima are lining up with the maxima, so that when we combine them, we get complete destructive interference. But if we have a variable phase relationship between our waves, and that we can do here by taking two waves. We start them both off at their maxima, but they have two different wavelengths. So when we add them together, we get variable interference because they had variable phase differences. That's called a beat pattern, right? The extent of interference between two waves depends on the relative phase difference when we add them together. 
Now, another way that we can introduce a phase difference is if we introduce an optical path difference, right? If we have two waves that are exactly the same, but we start them at different places, put a little delay in there and where we start this other wave, then they're going to be out of phase with each other. And the amount that they're out of phase with each other will depend on how big that optical path difference is. And therefore, when we take wave one and combine it with wave zero for interference, and then repeat that across all of these, we're going to get variable amounts of interference between the waves, ranging from constructive interference all the way, if the phase difference is just right, to destructive interference. How could we observe that in an experiment? Well, one famous example is the two-slit interference. Imagine we have photons coming through uh, two different slits, and they have well-defined phase, same phase coming in, and then we look over here at a screen. Well, each one of these is going to have a little bit different optical path length, and therefore there's an optical path difference that changes along the screen. Because of that, there's going to be an interference effect, and the intensity of light will show a characteristic interference pattern that depends on the wavelength of the light and the distance between those slits. Amazingly, in quantum mechanics, even a single photon incident on two slits goes through both slits at once and can interfere with itself. Another way that we could introduce an optical path difference between two photons that are initially in phase is if we have them interact with planes of atoms, for instance. Say, the atoms in a crystal. And we had x-rays coming in and some bounce off the first plane of atoms and some bounce off the next plane and some bounce off the, the plane below that. This looks like a multiple source interference phenomenon. And then when we look at the intensity over here, when we combine all these waves, we're going to see maxima at very well-defined angles. This can actually be used in powder x-ray diffraction to determine the distance between these planes. Now, is a photon really a particle or a wave? And the answer is, that's the wrong question. It's neither. Photons do exhibit wave-like properties. They have an oscillating electric and magnetic fields. They have a well-defined wavelength and frequency. They even have this well-defined phase and exhibit interference phenomena, just like we would expect from waves. But they also have particle-like properties. Photons can be absorbed or emitted to exchange energy, and they're absorbed completely all at once, right? Uh, they have an intrinsic spin, we'll find out an intrinsic angular momentum of one, but it only has components of plus or minus one. They can also impart linear momentum. They're massless, and we would normally associate linear momentum with a massive particle, but photons are massless. Nonetheless, they can have some small amount of linear momentum. So the photon really is a relativistic, massless quantum of the electromagnetic field. It doesn't comport either with our classical idea of a wave or a classical idea of a particle. It has wave-particle duality. Particles and waves are classical ideas, but a photon is a quantum phenomenon. Now we're going to use classical models, models, and we're going to use those models because our intuition is classical. We're going to use those models because that's the way we think, not because they are correct. So we're going to have to push those models as far as we can, but we've got to remember that when we're using quantum, uh, using classical models to describe quantum phenomena, we need new images, new language, new ideas, and so there may be inconsistencies in classical models when we try to apply them to quantum phenomena. And one of those is this idea of wave-particle duality. We've got to keep that in mind when we talk about quantum phenomena. So, photon energy comes in packets, we said, right, of H nu. And why is that important? Well, if the photon, each photon has a specific energy, then the intensity of a photon field is related to the number of 
of photons and therefore the power associated with a photon field depends on the number of photons per unit time times the photon energy. Remember, sometimes photons act like our classical models, sometimes they act like our classical particles, sometimes waves, but really they're the quantum of the electromagnetic field. That lets us understand then why different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum are associated with different types of degrees of freedom and excitations of those degrees of freedom because different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum have characteristic photon energies and those photon energies correspond to the energy differences of different degrees of freedom and excitations of those degree of freedom. And this will allow us to understand spectroscopy. For instance, in atomic spectroscopy, we see these nice, well-defined sharp lines at well-defined wave numbers. And the reason for that is that photons have to be resonant with a transition in order for them to cause that transition to occur. That is, the photon energy has to be equal to the energy difference between the states uh, that it's exciting for a transition from state one with an energy E1 and state going to state two at an energy E2, that energy difference has to match the photon energy. So there's a quick review of wave-like and particle-like behavior of photons and the idea of wave-particle duality in photons, the quantum of the electromagnetic field.